Okay, so this is part two. Joe Schummel, who does not understand rebirth. That's scary. Uh, you know, the gospel, but it's all been predetermined. So the first three I went through, were one was the prodigal son, and uh, he was definitely a son. He went astray. He came back after having been lost. His father said he was found. He was dead, but then he was again, he was alive again. And that Greek word there isn't palin, the word that's used in all the other passages for again. I break down that word uh, in that study, which we don't have time to get into here. It's a very interesting uh, word, but it basically talks about how he was dead, but he came to life again. Is he seriously trying to make a case that the prodigal son was born again and then rejected it and then came back and became born again? Because I don't see that in the text anywhere. I almost feel like it's more closely aligned in terms of this relationship story that, that entails the prodigal son. And I really think more of the starting out in the Garden of Eden and perfection. And then they left God when they disobeyed. And then they came back to God. Um, I mean, God did forgive them. But their children, more specifically, mankind that came out of Adam, has the ability to come back and be forgiven in Christ. So, I mean, if you really want to stretch it. I, that's kind of what comes to my mind more so than trying to make this tit for tat relationship of, you know, reborn and then losing it and coming back with the prodigal son. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I don't see that. And that story is about capturing the attitude of God's heart that he, he is willing to take sinners back. He loves us. And the recipe is the cross. Again, he wasn't physically dead, brothers and sisters. He was spiritually dead. And that shows that you can be a child of God and you can become a dead child spiritually. And you need to. Whoa. That is bizarre. That you can go from being spiritually alive to spiritually dead. Only in the case of Adam and Eve. I, I I don't think one other example in all of human history, sorry, um, you could make a case for that, that somebody goes from being spiritually alive to spiritually dead outside of the garden scenario that only involved two human beings and no one else. That is quite a stretch. I wonder if his muscles are sore from those back flips. That was bad, Joe. And you can't actually make a case that <laughs> the prodigal son was spiritually dead or physically dead. But I think there is within the context of that passage a relationship of, of humans in the prodigal story of the prodigal son, a relationship that died. So I don't think he... That, that, He's just adding in weird comparisons that I don't think fit well. You can be unborn again and spiritually damned after you're spiritually alive. Boy, that's that's interesting. I don't I don't see that in scripture anywhere. That is weird. He come back. He came to repent. So went back to his father, and he was received again, alive again. Uh, the next one we went to after that was Romans 11 which talks about how believers stand by faith, but they can be cut off. He's not talking about non-believers who aren't really saved. A non-believer isn't cut off from salvation. And those non-believers who were Gentiles who become believers stand by their faith and they're to fear lest they also are cut off from the salvation tree as the Jews who went into unbelief were cut off. But he says that the Jews... Okay, wait a minute. Go back. What? I got to hear that again. <laughs> Where was that? But they could be cut off. He's not talking about non-believers who aren't really saved. A non-believer isn't cut off from salvation. And those non-believers who were gent... Hold on. A non-believer is cut off from the possibility of salvation through unbelief. So everybody has a right and an ability, if you will, to get to their internal inheritance but you could get cut off in unbelief and the potentiality of getting to it is lost. 
And then as far as the natural branch, I think there's a warning there. Again, we're not talking <laughs> about a scenario that is clearly laid out that everybody that says that they're saved is legitimately, truly born again. And he's talking, I think, about these natural branch or these wild branches that if they get haughty, they could be broken off. Well, again, when, when okay, that's talking about the group dynamic. But when you look at the individual branches, again, you have people that are spiritually inoculated, are not born again, and are faking it. We already looked at that verse in the first video where Paul warns us that there are those who hold to a form of godliness but deny the power therein. Unbelief is the core issue. Unbelief is always the core issue of what would get you broken off or keep you from God, not your performance. It, if you got saved by your performance, nobody would ever get saved. If you are kept by your performance, this is so ridiculous. Nobody would ever be saved. The problem is that there's something wrong with us. And there is nothing wrong with Christ. And he bridges the gap. And the gap is a narrow, thin little road. One way, one door, one path, one salvation, one means. And most people will refuse it. But there is a subset of unbelievers who pretend, play games, mind game with you and with God and say that they're saved, but they're not really saved. So, you know, there's a lot more going on with that than he's letting on to. Boy, I'm getting a workout today. Gentiles who become believers stand by their faith and they're to fear lest they also are cut off from the salvation tree as the Jews who went into unbelief were cut off. But he says that the Jews who are in unbelief and were cut off the salvation tree, Paul says in Romans 11, can be grafted back in again. There that word again is, again, if they don't continue in their unbelief. And then the- Wait a minute. You have to turn from your unbelief. <laughs> you have to turn from your unbelief. And you get grafted back on, how? talking about the nation of Israel and we're talking about the potentiality of individual believers to repent and become born again. And that is on the table. Anybody can do that. The offer is available. Christ has it set up so that anybody can come to him. And even if you're a, of a Jewish DNA, you are welcome to come back into the family of God. You are welcome to come into the new branch, B-R-A-N-C-H, cap, the branch, the new head of humanity. And you have to do that by turning from your unbelief. This is like basic stuff. This is, this is, sorry, like Christianity 101 stuff. It really is. This is addressed and dealt with all throughout Hebrews 3 and 4. And the core issue is unbelief. And there are some people that are so deceived that they think they're in Christ, but they're really nurturing and unbelief. And they are so deceived and deceiving others. And I would tell you, and this breaks my heart because I, I used to listen to Joe all the time. I really liked him. I hated certain things that he would talk about. And this this one is um this is kind of a game breaker for me. Like if you don't understand how people get saved again, born again in the blood of Jesus, and kept in the blood of Jesus, and the unbelief keeps you from those things, I'm really scared for this guy, and I probably will not be willing to listen to him again. That's just weird that he doesn't get this as a pastor. I think this is purposely trying to confuse people. I really do. And I have talked about the media and the teachers that have led people in the confusion from a very organized standpoint and seeing him on God TV, boy, that doesn't make me feel very secure and comfortable. He's on God TV. So my goodness, how do you not understand the security of the believer in Christ, by Christ, through Christ? It's all about Christ. You're kept by Christ until the day of redemption. Yeah. So sealed, that means God is in you as a guarantee and a down payment. He, he doesn't do take backsies, okay? <laughs> the day of redemption is glorification. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. 
God is with you forever now. Don't break his heart. He's with you forever until the day of redemption. That's important. Not until the moment God displays a lack of being able to be long-suffering and acts like a human being and quits us. No, that, that's not what it says. It says until the day of redemption, there's a plan and God keeps his promises. That's why he's the covenant keeper. Third passage we looked at was Romans 4 and 5, where Paul talked about uh, being saved, uh, being saved from uh, the condemnation of the law. But he says he's fearful because they've gone back again to the elemental things and becoming enslaved again all over again to the law. And in chapter 5 of Galatians, he talks about, uh, he says, stand fast, uh, wherein, uh, you know, he talks about Christ has set you free and don't be entangled again. There that is again, the word again, again, and the yoke of bondage. He goes on to. Where does that say? And now you're unborn again. It's talking about in sanctification, setting your course towards the Lord. Can we ever be wrong or get into bad behavior, wrong thinking in our sanctification? Yes. <laughs> Of course you can. But that's why you have this admonishment from God. No, no, keep walking that way towards the metaphorical cross. Post the blood of Jesus. It doesn't mean that you can't ever go astray, but God is holding you and keeping you. And you, you might be in error, but you will never stay in error. The paraclete is there with you. The Holy Spirit, he... He directs you, and the word is his word to you, to pretty to encourage you, and and to direct you into right behavior. We're watching a Bible story, and the angel just came down. Mm -hmm. Oh, the angel of death just came through. All the doors that didn't have the lamb's blood got it. And that holds true to us today because if the lamb's blood is on the door of your heart, there is no changing things. It's there or it's not there. She's saying she, if it was her, she would obey and put the lamb's blood on her door. Well, that's what we've done today on our hearts. <clears throat> and that's what we've done. And that's what secured us as, as observing that lamb's blood. Because God observes the lamb's blood. This is all about the work of the lamb. This is not about what we do. And if there's an instance where we go astray or we go off, God doesn't just quit us. Not in the covenant. Warn them that if you are circumcised, uh, the context is to be justified, to be made right with God. Many have been circumcised, but the context is you're being circumcised to keep the law of Moses, kind of like a, you know, like a Jewish roots kind of thing. Judaism, uh, Ju the Judaizers were saying you gotta, you gotta have Moses, you gotta keep the feast days and so forth. And he says if you're circumcised, he says Christ will profit you nothing. He says those of you who are trying to be justified by the law, he says you've been cut off from the Christ. Can't be cut off unless you're in union with him, brothers and sisters, and you have fallen from grace. You can't fall out of something you're never. Again, he's directing that to an entire group of people. Did he go in and interview each and every person to see if each one of them is soundly saved? No, he's making a blanket statement. And he is encouraging everybody towards the right and correct path of salvation. He is not unaware of the idea that there can be false converts. Then you have the Judaizers come in and they reinforce what? False converts. Paul tells us later on in scripture, he says, you need to examine even yourself to make sure that you're of the faith. This is, this is so much deeper and this needing of a surgical precision and carefully analyzing all of these things so that you aren't led astray into what Joe is telling you. This is ridiculous. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ forever. But that doesn't mean that everybody that comes along and goes, I'm in Christ, actually literally is. And you can be deceived and 
you he's setting up a false paradigm that Christ isn't enough to keep you and save you and hold you but he's completely ignoring the whole false convert thing why would you do that Joe I think I know why I mean I hate to suspect that everybody in media is one of them but my word this is just, they are they are creating a sense of questioning within people and you should question if you're legitimately reborn but if you are there is no need to hassle you and harangue you that you are going to keep yourself safe through and then misquoting all these things taking it out of context and misapplying it this is your classic eisegesis not exegesis and that's why he's not taking you into a deep deep bible study maybe it's just because the show is only 29 minutes <clears throat> But, uh, you know, you're the one that chooses how many videos you want to do on a particular topic. So I feel like he is really deceiving and whitewashing people. And um, this is really going to spark the hearts of those that are not born again to give them more impetus and, and security that, yes, this is the truth, what Joe is telling you. And, of course, you never hear anything about being reborn again. <laughs> That's such fallacy, Joe. What are you doing? ever in and he's specifically dealing with those who are standing fast in the faith telling them to continue to stand fast it's a present tense greek imperative meaning it's 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 a, it's a command you better stand fast fast in the faith and not be entangled again in the yoke and bondage then he says what will happen if you again he's addressing a letter to an entire group of people it, it would be different if he was addressing one person that you knew, lock, stock, and barrel, was born again. And you'd be like, whoa, wait a minute. Let's, let's zone in on this. He's addressing a massive conglomerate of people for which there's a very good chance that some of them are not saved, especially when you consider Christ's words. Narrow is the way. There's a broad way that many people take, and there's a narrow way that few, few be that find it. So he is making a proclamation out to both paths and telling them what is necessary. And what is necessary is walking on that narrow path. Not that they're going to lose their salvation, but to address those that may not even have it. And to reinforce, yes, you are doing the right thing. Keep going. Keep going. He's a mentor to an entire group of all of these churches. Writing the Bible. I don't know if he knew that he was writing the Bible or not. I suspect he didn't know that. I have no idea. But the Holy Spirit knew that. This is um, this is not careful biblical exegesis and good hermeneutics. And even a child of logic here, so to speak. Where is his logic? This is really concerning to me. I don't like this. Okay, let's keep going here. If you do go back to the law of Moses, Christ will profit you nothing. You'll be cut off from Christ. You'll fall from grace. Serious, serious stuff. So we looked at three of those passages. Uh, now I want to look at Second Peter. I want to. I okay, again, speaking to a group of people, if there's people that legitimately did not get born again, and then they go with the Judaizers and go back to the law of Moses, which would mean they're right back in the same position in unbelief, but in religiosity, they can't be saved. It does not say that we know for a fact they were born again, people lost their salvation, went back to the law of Moses. That's his interpretive spin he's putting on the text. But that is not in the text. That's what he is pushing onto the text. When you're dealing with a group of people, you never infer upon them that you know for a fact that every single person is saved. I know Lauren Daigle does that when she goes to prisons, and she will talk to all the prisoners as if they are all universally saved, which you should not do because it is a it is putting a false sense of security on an entire diverse group of people. You shouldn't do that. You should give them the gospel and then tell what applies to those who have come to the gospel. Um, Paul is also, being that he's, you know, an apostle and all, is being very careful when he is distinguishing and talking about a group of people and encouraging 
and telling them these would definitely be bad things. She's not saying, oh, you're in danger of losing her salvation. He never says that. I'm looking for those teachings. I'm looking for those specific words. And I'm just seeing somebody that is pushing through Isa Jesus, their interpretive spin upon the text. That's not what I see Paul saying. Big difference. And that really is the way I see it of 21st century Gentile American teaching and leadership for biblical interpretation, which I think is awful. I would love to have done all five, but you know what? Could not do justice to Second Peter. And we're also going to look at Hebrews 6, which also deals with another again uh, in a subsequent uh, time when we get together. Anyways, in Second Peter, Chad had read where he's definitely talking to Christians. And what's indicative of the fact that he's talking to Christians there, Chad, in the first four verses? Well, first of all, you're escaping. You have a faith of the same kind of uh, Same kind of ours. faith, that's right. I mean... I mean, you go through it. He's granted us everything, granted us, so he includes himself right. in that. Everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who Amen. loves us. I mean, right. he writes us, of our God and Savior, our, he's talking to believers, Jesus, our Lord. So he's definitely addressing believers here. And you don't warn believers, uh, you don't warn a non-believer to abide in the faith or he'll be cut off, you know? <laughs> uh, that, that'd be ridiculous. Yeah. If I see somebody, pastoral counsel abide in the faith well we don't just go on autopilot and god does everything for us yes there there is a cooperation it's called sanctification there is a, a cooperation there is the necessity to feed on the word and feed on christ and prayer and fasting and biblical meditation abiding in christ getting what you need from christ because there are various sources where you can be about other things that have nothing to do with Christ. So, he, yes, I don't have a problem with the fact that he's telling Christians to abide in Christ. How is that you've lost your salvation? This is really poor Jesus. Bad. So <clears throat> well, I know the person's not walking with Jesus. I don't say, yeah, just continue and you'll be fine in the end. No, I tell that person to repent and get right with Jesus. Yeah, I mean. But you tell believers to abide. And continue now what's interesting here is the the the, the, the a very typical greek word there's a number of greek words used for the word knowledge you know and i was going to get the five or six different greek words but uh one of the most popular words is gnosis and it's a general knowledge it's used for knowledge over and over again but there's another word which intensifies with the epa uh the you know the word epa in front of gnosis epi epinosis which is an intensifier and it speaks of experiential knowledge and it's, what's interesting is you can't say in Second Peter is talking about those who never knew the Lord. So we'll say, oh, they must never have known the Lord because this word is used of saved people who can fall away. And in verse three, Chad, maybe you can read verse three because the word there is through the knowledge of epinosis, through the epinosis or experiential knowledge of him. Yeah, it says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Okay, through our knowledge, epinosis of him in verse two and three. Again, to whom that pl would apply to is actual born again believers amongst a big group of people. Again, you don't know who is legitimately born again when speaking to a group, especially by a letter to be delivered to churches and who may be falsely saved grace and peace be multiplied to you by means of an experiential knowledge or epinosis of god that's what i'm looking for i'm sorry grace and peace be multiplied to you by means of an experiential knowledge an epinosis of god even jesus our lord so those who have jesus as lord and he's lord of your life you don't just know him objectively because you believe he died and rose from you, but you've put your trust in him. You've called upon him as your Lord. You're relating to him through prayer and through his word, and you have a knowing relationship with him. So I think this is very, very important that we understand this because uh, then he goes on to talk. About, well, let me just say this. This word epinosis, I remember years and years and years ago, I did a word study in epinosis, and I was shocked. I was like, wow, this word is used over and over again in the New Testament for saving knowledge of Christ. In fact, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.4, 
that God, he says, desires all men to be saved and come to a epinosis of the truth and experiential knowledge. God wills that all would be saved and come to a experiential knowledge of the truth. Just a gnosis of the truth or a plain knowledge of the truth without actually calling upon Jesus as your Lord and experiencing him in salvation is not enough. You have to have the epinosis of Jesus. Now we can use the word gnosis to describe knowing the Lord, uh, just like we use the English word knowing, and it's a fine word to describe salvation. But when the word epinosis is used, it's, eph it's used as an emphasis of actually knowing Jesus. In the Greek, you would see experiential knowledge. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.25, talking about bringing an apostate back to the fold with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them a change of mind leading to an epinosis of the truth or leading to an experiential knowledge, epinosis of the truth. Listen to 2 Timothy. So an apostate is someone who does not have the Holy Spirit. And yes, you want to bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ and be truly transformed. We know from Jude's letter in the 19th verse, it goes over a whole cadre of various fakes, liars, and leaders. And in the 19th verse, it talks about that in the fourth verse. In the 19th verse, after this whole litany of all these things that are bad, 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 excuse me, that you can expect, it clearly says, they do not have the Holy Spirit. They are deceived and deceiving others. He doesn't seem to understand that. 3-7. It talks about the state of the last days when you have all kinds of people, you know, getting all kinds of degrees and just pursuing different, you know, their bachelors and their masters and their PhDs. And it says always learning. Last days, terrible times will come. Then in verse 7, it says always learning and never able to come to and epinosis of the truth. Not just a gnosis, an epinosis and experiential knowledge of the truth. So God wills that we'd all be saved and come to an epinosis. And that's what these brothers and sisters had experienced. And when Chad read those first four verses, they found Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. Uh, uh, they, 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 he, they attained, as Chad said, the same faith that Peter had. And that's why Peter describes them as having come to an epinosis of the Lord. Titus 1.1 Listen to this, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ uh, for the faith of those chosen of God and an experiential knowledge or an epinosis of the truth, which is according to uh, spirituality. Very interesting. So we have this word. Well, yes. And how do you obtain that personal, intimate knowledge of God? You get born again. The Holy Spirit goes in you. But again, People that are deceived don't know how to tell the difference between religious orientation and actual rebirth. And you have to consider the fake Christians alongside the real deal. So he's he's dividing this really strangely. And basically those pictures of somebody sitting on a branch and then you're cutting the branch off that you're sitting on is spiritually what he's doing doing excuse me not cool epinosis which is used of a salvific knowledge of a saving knowledge and, and of knowing jesus experiencing his communicable attributes in the context of the verses five through seven uh if we would have gone on to read it talks about adding to your faith because they're in the faith these various communicable virtues god has uh incommunicable attributes we could never share in his being uncreated uh at immortality as an uncreated entity who's been from everlasting to everlasting. There's certain things we can't share, uh, um, uh, uh, omnipresence and so forth, but we can share uh, the, the attributes he calls us to add on as we grow in the faith so we will not fall away from this epinosis because go ahead, Chad, and read chapter 1, verse 8. Yeah, and before I read that, just know uh, Joe did a, a long series uh, going through the pil pillars there, five through seven. Versus five through seven, how to grow um, in your faith. That uh, I think that Tony was going to turn it into a resource as well on the site, hopefully. You know what? We really should do that because I'm telling you guys right now, I've been teaching for, at Blessed Hope, for 30 years now, 30 years this year. And that was one of the most, and I did that last year. I'd never, if I had, it had not been so many people that had come up to me and had, had mentioned what an impact it had on their walk with God. Okay, abiding, growing in the Lord has to do with sanctification, not God 
throwing you out and going, you're not justified anymore. He is misapplying these verses. And this one here, it says, for the, um, if you possess these qualities and continue to grow in them, which will happen as a result of what? The Holy Spirit in you, and you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. But you have choice, right? If you don't want to do anything for Christ or very little for Christ, that's, that's yours to decide. But you won't have very much for all of eternity. And the inverse of that, or the, the, the vice versa of that is true as well. Uh, so continue to grow on them as the admonition, right? The Lord wants you to know, keep going, keep going, keep going, because he's going to build fruit. He's going to build fruit out of your life. And they will keep you from being ineffective, not thrown away, not divorced, not cut off, not unborn again, not losing your salvation, but ineffective, idle, lazy, thoughtless, <laughs> I'm sorry, unprofitable, injurious, lazy, useless, useless to the cause of Christ. And unproductive, barren, profitless, unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Challenge. That could really be helpful. Yeah, that became a memory verse for me. I, yeah, I was going to say. The seven pillars of the faith. <laughs> oh, praise That's God. Really good, yeah. Two different artists in the church drew the pillars in their own ways. One made a game out of it. I mean, the way he drew it up, you know, the, how you go through life and you add these things and then you get to the kingdom. And wow. Chuck, as you know, made these seven pillars, you know, uh, you know, doodling, you know, in a quite fantastic way during my message. Yeah, yeah, but I, go on, bro. Yeah, no, I just remember coming up here to record a show and Tony was going through how he was memorizing it. So I just wanted to throw that up there. And I know we're already, I know it doesn't sound like it, but we're already getting short on time. So I won't caveat you again. <laughs> all right. Uh, so verse eight, it says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. For he who lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Show the people these signs. Do not let them go. Let's go here. Okay, yes, but whoever lacks these traits is nearsighted to the point of blindness. This is in sanctification. Haven't forgotten that he has been cleansed by his past sins, which is justification. So there are people that even though they're Christians, they can be selfish. They can produce very little, if anything, from God. And who do you think that is being talked about that will, uh, they will be saved, yet their works will be burned up, the wood, the hay, and the stubble. And they will go away smelling like smoke because all of the things that they spent their life on were them, them, you know, me, myself, and I kind of a thing. Um, you could do that. And it's not wise, but you can do that if you want to blitz the whole eternal opportunity for rewards, authority, crowns, and so on and so forth, it is yours to set that sucker on fire and lose it all if you want to. But Paul is very careful in communicating, but you yourself will be saved, though it's through fire. So there is quite the inability of these people to understand what sanctification is, how it works. And it is always going to be in your best interest to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in your sanctification and your forthcoming bema and the things that work well for people as you're being admonished is to always be remembering from whence you were bought from where you came from and to be plotting a course of allowing christ and the holy spirit to produce fruit in you that you cooperate with god in that and grow and change and be a workman of good rapport to God, a tool that he comes to and uses often. But that's that's also completely in your will. You have so many choices allotted to you in this life. 
And not everybody makes wise ones, even in their sanctification. So, of course, scripture would come in and, and encourage you to, to not be to this point of blindness. That's not talking about being lost and thrown away. And remember, when, when you're talking about not having your sins covered, we're talking about you're going to hell. So if these people really want to beat on a platform that God just, you know, he's just done with you. You know, you cussed that 50 first time and, and somehow 50 was the limit. And you cussed for 51 times and then God's like, oh, I'm done with you. You, my child, my beloved, my bride, I'm divorcing you. Even though we're in covenant together, I'm not a truce breaker. It's just all performance based, which is not true. It's by grace. I'm throwing you away and I'm sending you to hell. That, my friends, is not the God of the Bible. Not in the renewed covenants. Not in the blood of Jesus Christ. That shepherd, I don't recognize. That is not my shepherd. My shepherd is so otherness, so unique, so different, so kind, so long-suffering with believers in their justification. He is unlike anything that has ever walked this earth. Sanctification is not justification, and the church is not teaching people this. It's justification, then sanctification, then glorification. And yes, each one of those pieces along the way matter, and you can't mix them all together. There are phases, stages. There are certain things in his plan being worked out per each one of those things. And I would never allow some biblical teacher to be the only one to feed me and inform me. Never. That's so not my personality. But we should be cognizant of where we came from. And we should have good, clear vision on the goal and be aligned with the goals of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times that has to do with self-sacrifice, not being selfish, not being lazy, but working into a pattern of good works and serving the purposes of God, even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't want to. But I would say that your attitude does matter, so you should have an attitude adjustment. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is this is a big thing that he's not taking into consideration, which is scary. ...to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this... And this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Amen. And uh, you can even translate that that in this way, meaning if you add these virtues to your faith, they'll abundantly supply to you the, the, the uh, strength to continue in the faith and have an entrance into the kingdom. Now, it's interesting because he says if these... Hold on. And an entrance into the kingdom? If you're justified, you already have an entrance into the kingdom. This is not works-based. Why does this man seem to have a workspace gospel? That is not the gospel. It never has been. It never will be. Are you meaning to tell me that this guy is a pastor of a church and he has this whole organization of Good Fight Ministries and this man doesn't understand how people get saved and how people are kept saved? I am disturbed. Your works do not make for you a way into the kingdom. Christ's works do, not yours. You just, through your works, get a place in the kingdom come via authority, crowns, um, you know, wh whatever, power, control, etc., etc. In the new heaven and the new earth, those two things are not to be confused. Either he is a master deception artist or he is just really that ignorant of scripture. And yeah, it matters. It matters. I wouldn't put one thing on the cross with Jesus Christ's perfection to say that I'm saved by it. Not one. Because I wouldn't want to nullify the covenants. That's how people get deceived. And I would have to tell you that as much as this hurts me to say it, I feel like Joe Schimmel and friends are deceived and deceiving others. So be it. Take responsibility for it.
It be what it be. Qualities are yours and are increasing. You're growing in the Lord, right? They render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Remember what Jesus said with the, the branch without the fruit, right? It gets cut off. With respect to an experiential knowledge and epinosis of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to grow now in verse 8 in that epinosis we have in Jesus. So we don't fall away because, and keep in mind, brothers and sisters, he's not talking about a said faith. Oh, well, they just had a profession of faith. It was an empty profession. They were never really washed for their sins. Chad just read it. It says you'll, you'll forget that you were washed or purified from your past sins. So let nobody tell you, well, if someone falls away, they were never really cleansed. They were never really forgiven. They were never. No, just because you're being reminded in your sanctification of where you got saved and how you got saved does not a case make for loss of salvation. You should always be reminded of from whence you came. I don't like his teaching at all. And, you know, when you consider over the course of a person's existence and them maybe being a little slower in their growth, maybe coming from a place of really big selfishness and inactivity, you know, humans tend to take a snapshot of a person's existence and then make an entire determination of it. Whereas God looks at the whole enchilada. And there's something to be said for, let's say there's a five-year period where someone is just really in a lack of growth. So anyhow, if that person is inactive and not growing much fruit or doing much for, say, five years out of, let's say the person is saved for 30 years, and they start reading those passages and the Holy Spirit's working on them in year six, and seven, and eight, then, wow, something starts happening in the year 9 and 10, and they really start getting it. They really start working and serving and growing in the Lord and doing stuff. That is a progression in sanctification. This abiding, this growing, this working, this walking, this, this becoming more Christ-like. And it... It has nothing to do with your justification. It has nothing to do with being tossed away to God to hell. It really doesn't. His, his logic is so flawed. And because there's a, a, a group of at least two people that are agreeing, it sounds authoritative because they agree with one another. But I think that when you, this is why, my husband always says this, people need to read the Bible for themselves. You need to study it for yourself. And you need the full counsel of God. That's what we talk about a lot at my house. Yes, you can look at a verse, but it's really important. And this is what we do. You need to know what's going on in the whole paragraph. You need to know what's going on in the whole chapter. You need to know what's being talked about in the whole book. What is the context of the book? And then you need to look at what all 66 of the books together communicate to you. So, you know, you have to be really careful about this slick, deceptive way that people can, you know, strap verses together and make the Bible say whatever they want it to say, which is not good biblical hermeneutic. And that's what I think you have with these people. And, you know, they just must be exhausted in their salvation to think that you have to grip onto God's hand every waking second. And if you, if you sin or you sin one time too many or you you make a mistake or you, you know, you, you don't grow for a few weeks or whatever that God is just right there and ready to just whack you, you know, send you off to hell. I mean, that is, would be a hard way to live. That is not the grace that has been given to you. It's not, that is very works oriented. That is exhausting. You should do those things with the motivation of love, which frees you from the bonds of fear and do it because you've been saved, not because you fear that he's going to turn on you any second. There's no darkness in him, John says. There's no turning with this one. If he says, I've got you and I've got you forever, I've got you. Because we're in covenant with one another. You're in a marriage covenant, more specifically with the bridegroom. And he doesn't divorce, not in the new renewed covenant it doesn't happen 
And so there is a level of comfort. You know, he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take upon myself, take upon yourself my yoke, for it is, the burden is easy and light. Not demonstrably torturous, like walking around with one of those big, huge, weighty um, things on your chain. You know what I'm talking about? They, they always have those things when people joke around about getting married. Um, they used to put them on prisoners and stuff like that. I remember, the, oh, the ball on the chain, remember? <laughs> it ain't supposed to be like that. Really watched, read chapter 18 of the book of Matthew, where Jesus talks about the unmerciful servant who lost the forgiveness that he received from the father and was thrown into torment, okay, because he refused to forgive. Okay, hold on. If you're in Christ... You, you have the first initial most important thing. And once you're in Christ, then the Holy Spirit helps you to forgive others. But if you're not even in Christ, you're not even in a position to be able to forgive others. There's so much more going on than what this guy is saying. I mean, he literally is taking it to the point where let's say you've been born again for 60 years and somebody hurts you and it, it's 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 on you you know you're 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 mad you know let's say somebody came and just a drunk driver came and wiped your daughter out you know fifth time caught drunk driver who just wiped your daughter out murdered her and you're struggling you are struggling in that moment he would have you to believe that if he passed out from a stroke or something like that, died, and he hadn't forgiven that man right then in that moment, though being reborn, that's it. God is done with you. You're going to hell. I don't think that's what scripture is teaching at all. You got to you gotta get your forgiveness from God to ever even be enabled to be in a position of being able to forgive others as a way of life and something the Holy Spirit procures within you as a change of attitude. And as far as an unprofitable servant, um, I don't think, if he, I'm not sure which one he's talking about, but I know that one of the uh, parables was talking, up, I think it was the parable of the talents, and it had, it had three people. Two were saved, and the unprofitable one was not, never got saved. Yeah. Now, it's interesting here, they forget that they're washed after they have escaped the corruptions of the world. Then they forget that they're washed from their past sins because they don't grow in their epinosis. Then in chapter 2, he warns about false teachers who deny the Lord who bought them. <laughs> and he talks about <laughs> angels who fell as a warning that if angels who he says are greater than, greater, greater than us, they fell, right? And then he talks about those who have forsaken the right way and have gone astray. In verse 15, have forsaken the right way and gone astray. And then in verse 18, these deceivers, these false prophets, who are they deceiving? They're targeting those who, quote, listen to this, folks. They're targeting those who are just escaping from those who live in error. And the, and the, oldest, the best manuscripts are they're, they're targeting those who are barely escaping from those who who live in error. So they're targeting weaker Christians with, with a message of sensuality that you can do your own thing. You don't really have to abide in Christ, you know, and so forth, or you don't have to take your walk so seriously or and so forth. So they're targeting those who are just escaping from those who live in error. Now, how did he describe Christians in chapter one, verse four? Those who've escaped the corruptions of the world. Now, in light of that, the way he describes Christians as having been those who have escaped the corruptions of the world through epinosis, right, which is saving knowledge, as we've seen. Chad, go ahead and read verses 20 through 22. Listen, for, folks. For Wait a minute. He... Hold on a second. Wait a minute. Because Second Peter agrees with Jude, and Jude clearly defines these apostates as... Let me go to the King James here. I can read it all at once. As people that do not have the Holy Spirit. And he can't show me a verse that clearly delineates and tells me you can have the Holy Spirit in this age of grace and then not have the Holy Spirit. That only happened one time in um, in Genesis where they had the Holy Spirit 
body, soul, temple, and then the Holy Spirit left. I don't, I don't see that occurring in the New Testament anywhere. Well, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the, the Holy Spirit never indwelt inside of a human. He was in the pillar of fire by night, the cloud of the cloud by day. He was in the temple and the tabernacle, but he was never, ever, ever inside of a person until after the day of Pentecost. Whoa, wait a minute. You're saying that he wasn't in King David? Because they do an anointing ritual where they take a horn of oil from an animal, fill it up with olive oil, and pour it over him. And it's kind of there's, a visual of the a, Holy Spirit going on prophets and, in that case, a king. There's a, there was a communication that I don't think we'll understand this side of glory uh, between the Ruach HaKadosh and someone. Um, but it wasn't a physical embodiment until after the day of Pentecost. I disagree, but I would say the Pentecost it had a, an issue of permanence. Well, you find in the Bible where it tells me otherwise. Well, not in the Old it, Testament, you have, I just gave you an example. There were, there were kings it that had the Holy Spirit. The and the Holy then, Spirit rested in them. Well, David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Well, yeah, the Holy Spirit. So, look at it, think of it this way, kind of in reverse. Demons can harass the crap out of and hang around humans that are Christians. They can't possess them, but once they're a Christian... They can still hang around them and communicate with them and harass them and do things to them uh, if they allow that. But the demon is never inside as a Christian. But we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I and know. We're talking it's, about it's the same thing in prophets the Holy and Spirit kings. Can communicate with a person so that they feel closer to God. The Holy Spirit could. Um, be around someone so they feel closer to God, but the Holy Spirit was never in uh, physical, intimate contact. Why else do you think Jesus said what he said? Why else do you think Paul said about what? He said? what? About the Holy Spirit. My understanding is that he can rest, that he can and did rest in specific entities for specific purposes. But that when the new well, covenant came, it, it was for everybody. Well, I need a little more than that. Well, you've got all kinds of Hebrew Bibles. No, I mean, if, if you're if you're coming to assert that, then I need something more than that. Well, if you're trying to tell me that the Holy Spirit indwelt in David, then how was it he was able? To kill a man and have sex with Beersheba. Well, what does that have to do with the Holy Spirit in you? People could do that now with the Holy Spirit in them. People can sin. What does that have to do with anything? He had no remorse until Nathan, right, came and kind of like smacked his head into the wall and gave him a hint. What does that have to do with whether the Holy Spirit can indwell an Old Testament person for a specific if purpose. If we did that, we would have had all kinds of remorse without someone having to smack us in the head. What we, does remorse quickly enough have to do with whether the Holy Spirit was on someone or not? You seriously have to ask that question? We, as New Testament Christians, cannot get away with sin without the Holy Spirit chastising us. He didn't get away with it. That's why God implemented a prophet. He punished him. That has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. That's not even the topic well, of discussion. Well, do you seriously think that if the Holy Spirit was inside of him, that God would have used a prophet instead of using the Holy Spirit? That's how he did it back in the Old Testament. Okay, well, you realize that I'm right in the middle of trying to do a video, so now you've broken into five minutes worth of my video to argue with me. Not arguing. You are. Well, that's very interesting here. Um, Psalm 51, 11, cast not away from your presence. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And then this person says uh, over here, Ligonier 
So yes, Pentecost is apocal. It's redemptively a significant moment, a unique moment in redemptive history. There's something about the fullness of the spirit and perhaps the experience of that fullness under the new covenant that is different from the old covenant. But if the question is, were Old Testament saints indwelt by the spirit? I think I would have to say yes. Well, I would even qualify that to be more specific to say certain kings and certain prophets. You know, the word of the Lord came to me. And I see that as an act of him resting upon a particular person for a particular mission. But when it comes to Pentecost, now this is something that was available to everyone and the goal to get people reborn. Immediately, the spirit of the Lord took control of David and was with him from that day on. I have found David, my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people. 1 Samuel 16, 13. By the way, the day that that anointing would take place is on your all too famous feast of trumpets, Yom Teru, Yom Adin, etc., etc., as many names. And the olive oil is a physical symbol for the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> okay, so verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And the Old Testament sets up a nice framework for us understanding later at Pentecost when that privilege would be available to all people that would repent as opposed to the Old Testament where it appears that only certain people for very specific purposes. <sighs> to, into, and towards. So the Holy Spirit went into King David and that oil was a physical picture to show the anointing. Now you'll know that anointed is what Jesus is and Jesus is called the Christ. The Christ means the anointed meaning he's the one that has the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's interesting. And so the word is L. Okay, yeah. Into. Where the limit is actually entered into. As in they went into the ark. And many examples of the use of into. Interesting. In addition to. So David and the Holy Spirit. Now in the Old Testament, Saul had the Holy Spirit taken from him. That was a completely different scenario. That's why I'm into dispensations. They are in the Bible. Paul does use that word. And Hebrews is even one that I can just immediately tell you. He talks about dispensations. In the New Testament, it's 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 all or nothing. You know, it's pass or fail. It's it's playing for keeps. Okay, look at this. Expressing presence at a spot. This is very specific. This would then completely make sense as to why King David in the Psalms said, Take not thy presence from me. He did not want the Holy Spirit to do to him what the Holy Spirit did to Saul, who really didn't want the Holy Spirit. He went to visit the witch of Endor. I mean, yeah, sure, all, all this stuff about into and next and by and all that, but upon, it, it all flows together. It's all the same concept at the end of the day within 
into, upon, within, towards. through okay that is not the case leading forward then into the new testament if the holy spirit is in you the holy spirit is in you forever we'll just try to get through this last couple minutes of his broadcast after they have escaped the defilements of the world there's again by the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled there's a word again in them they're again entangled <laughs> And are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returned to its own vomit, and is so, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. That's right. Now... <clears throat> Again, where is rebirth in that? You can have people that sit in churches and church pews for 20 and 30 years hearing what? The Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. But if they remain in unbelief, even if they taste all that, even if they're exposed to all that information and knowledge, if they don't repent from unbelief and get born again, it won't matter. Again, the, these people think nothing to include fakers into the situation. And so there is warning to those who are playing the game with God that are not legitimately born again. And unfortunately, these teachers do not see this. It, they're looking for any opportunity to come along and to rip the Holy Spirit away from you in the new covenant through really, really bad hermeneutics. Now, you have this sow, this pig that goes back to wall in the mire after having been washed. Some once they'd always say to people, oh, that means it was never really washed or it was never really born again, that pig. That's not his point. The point is in second or in flip at second Peter chapter one, their followers of Jesus have the same faith that Peter has. They've been washed from their sins. They've escaped the corruptions of the world, he says, and they forget that he, they've been washed from their sins. So it's talking about someone who has genuinely been washed. So now Peter uses this illustration that you can, after having escaped the corruption of the world, he goes back to what he said in chapter one about the believers, by knowing, now check this out, by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Guess what the word is translated knowing right there? And this, I'm reading from the NIV because it actually brings out, it doesn't just say the knowledge of, it's not just gnosis, it's epinosis. If they have escaped the corruption by experiential knowledge or by knowing epinosis, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, and overcome, that word is used of someone who is put in a hopeless state, who is like a fish, it's used of a fish caught in a net. They are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. I mean, it, was, it's be, it would be better that they'd never been saved in the first place. They're worse off at the end than at the beginning. It would be, have been, listen to this, it would be, have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it. And then, and what's the way of righteousness? Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and life. The early church was called the way. Then to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Brothers and sisters. Again, you can be ensconced in all sorts of knowledge. You can be in a home or a church or whatever where you're hearing scripture all the time. But if you don't act on it to actively, truly, legitimately get born again, and you stay in that unbelief, by mere outward appearances, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, you are not legitimately converted into a new creation. You never got there. But by mere appearances, it may have looked as if you were one who tasted of these things or heard of these things or were exposed to knowledge. You can be exposed to knowledge. <coughs> How many marriages do you think are out there where the wife is really, really sure she's born again, but she has serious doubts about the husband? or the other way around for that example. And they, they have scripture all over the house, Bible programs on all the time, da, da 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 Can you have someone that is playing the game, that is, you know, holding on to their will, refusing to come to Christ, but still with an outward appearance of godliness that doesn't truly get born again, and then their behavior will look a particular way? I, I think so. I think they're not dividing well enough and they're they're so willing to throw Christ and his blood under the bus. It's really irritating. 
believers, describes Christians as those who have escaped the corruption of the world, chapter one, who have been washed and who need to grow in their faith if they want to enter the kingdom. Then he goes on to warn about those who are targeting those who have just escaped. See what he just said? I'm about done with this because I'm tired of this now. He said that you have to work a certain way to be able to enter the kingdom. So for him, that's that's it. It's not by the blood of Jesus that you enter the kingdom. It's by what you do, which is not by grace through faith. So I've had enough of this broadcast. Um, I hope that this has been eye-opening. We spent a lot of time on this, but you will hear a lot of people who will torture verses. They'll go through Hebrews. They will play around with things. There's another scripture there in Hebrews 10 where it talks about if you continue sinning, and they, ne and, you know, then then you you're gonna get it. And uh, that's a paraphrase. And they never connect the issue of unbelief, continuing in sin of unbelief. Then you will be cut off and so on and so forth. So you also have to look at what the full counsel of other books are all saying. And you, the, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It's just so sophisticated and so much going on with it. And you really have to, I mean, this is why I think you have God picking Paul to write so much of the New Testament through the Holy Spirit, because you really start to get familiar with who he is, his writings, his language style, everything having to do with how he communicates, the flavor of his message. And so it's really nice when you read so many consistent letter after letter after letter, all these letters you know, written by Paul and others too, but I'm specifically talking about Paul. And in it, Paul says, we have the assurance of faith if we are in the faith. So, and not everybody is in the faith, even those who may possibly look like it. But in all reality, there are many who are not solidly born again. And so Joe can say whatever he wants, but at the end of the day, it's grace through faith forever. And that's what I'm sticking with. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye.